Computers today can do incredible things. They allow us to browse the internet, send emails, and most importantly, share memes on Facebook. <laughs> they also enable life-saving medical imaging, advanced scientific simulations, and global financial networks. Without question, computers have revolutionized society. But what if we wanted to build a computer that could see and hear and perceive the world? Or a robot that could act with the agility and intelligence of a cat or dog? This is, of course, the goal of artificial intelligence. But if we could build such a computer, what would it tell us about ourselves? This is the question that inspired me to become a researcher in artificial intelligence. As far as we can tell, we are our brains. All of our thoughts, memories, personalities, and motivations are encoded up there somehow. Understanding the brain would open up new doors in psychology, sociology, and mental health. One way to get a better understanding of the brain is to try to build one. So why can't we? Put simply, brains in computers were built to solve two very different sets of problems. Computers were built to follow instructions, executing one calculation after another very rapidly. Brains were built to survive, using intuition and continuously adapting to a changing environment. Intuition is the ability to know the answer to something without needing to know why. It's sort of our gut instinct. For instance, when you see your friend on the street, you immediately recognize him or her. You don't need to stop and think, what color is this person's hair? Are they wearing glasses? You just know it's them all at once. Adaptation is the ability to change in response to your environment. Learning, for instance, is a form of adaptation. We change our understanding of the world by interacting with it. It turns out that adaptation and intuition are really difficult to program in the conventional sense. And that's because the real world is complicated, and you can't possibly include every scenario that a computer might run into. But over the past five years or so, we have begun making incredible progress in replicating these facets of intelligence. I'm sure you've heard of self-driving cars or noticed that automatic language translation has improved dramatically. Or maybe you've noticed that now you can speak to your smartphone. These are all because of breakthrough advancements in the science of artificial neural networks. Neural networks are algorithms that are inspired by biological brains. They were originally designed to help us understand how the neurons and their connections or synapses in our own brains work. Since they were first invented, neural networks have come a long way, and we can now do pretty incredible things with them. For instance, we can teach them to translate between two languages, or drive a car, or recognize cats in images. These networks are what's known as massively parallel. They allow a lot of simple computations to be done at the same time. But our current processors don't work like this. They process one piece of information after another. This makes our current processors really bad at simulating neural networks. Despite this, neural networks have become state-of-the-art algorithms in many fields. But even our largest, most powerful networks are still only a tiny fraction of the size of even a mouse's brain. Even these comparatively small networks can take months to train on our best supercomputers. If we, as we try to scale the network by adding more and more neurons, the amount of time that it takes to simulate them takes longer and longer. Eventually, we reach a point where it's simply not practical to simulate. For practical neural networks such as in speech and video recognition, this point is about a million neurons or the size of a honeybee's brain. A mouse's brain, let alone a human's, is beyond reach for now. If we want to build truly scalable neural networks, we need to fundamentally rethink our computing hardware. In particular, we need to design processors specifically for neural networks with a massively parallel architecture. 
This would allow us to run and train our neural networks in real time, independent of the size of the network. The field tackling this problem is called neuromorphic computing. Neuromorphic computing moves beyond the standard computing paradigm and builds physical neuron and synapse circuits onto a chip, mimicking biological brains. My hope is that these neuromorphic processors will someday help us understand our own brains. Unfortunately, these neuromorphic processors are not scalable either, but in a different way. Whereas conventional processors take too much time to simulate, neuromorphic architectures take up too much space. As you try to pack more neurons onto a chip, the amount of wiring that you need to connect all of them together quickly gets out of hand, even for relatively small networks. Not coincidentally, this is a constraint that's also shared by biological brains. In both neuromorphic architectures and biological brains, you need to connect large numbers of neurons with modifiable connections in a scalable way. The difference between the two is that biological brains have found a solution. In real brains, we don't see these fully connected grid-like networks of neurons like we commonly see in neuromorphic architectures. Instead, they're sparsely connected, where two neurons that are very, closely, very close together have a high probability of being connected, while neurons that are very far apart have a much lower but still significant probability of being connected. This creates a network that's very well connected while only requiring a tiny fraction of the total possible number of connections. Fewer connections means less wiring, and less wiring means a more scalable architecture. This type of sparse random connectivity is known as small world connectivity. Small worldness embodies the concept of six degrees of separation, the idea that you are connected to any other person on Earth through at most six people. Similarly, every neuron in your brain is connected to any other neuron through a very small number of intermediate neurons. Fully parallel small world connectivity is really difficult to achieve in hardware, but being able to replicate it would not only allow for scalable neuromorphic architectures, it would also give neuroscientists a valuable new tool for building large-scale models of biological brains. This is the problem at the center of my research at the University of Florida. We've created a new method for connecting large arrays of artificial silicon neurons using ultra-thin synaptic wires that can connect neurons with realistic synapses. The resulting network is sparse and random with small world connectivity, very similar to the types of connectivity that we see in biological brains. The fact that these neuromorphic architectures require similar patterns of connectivity as biological brains in order to scale suggests that this is their purpose in biological brains. We also know that the algorithms that we use to train our artificial neural networks are incompatible with the physical structure of the brain. It's simply not physically possible for the brain to be implementing these algorithms in their current form. So in order to understand the hardware or the software of the brain, the algorithms, we also need to understand its hardware. This means creating artificial neural networks with the same physical constraints as biological brains. Overcoming these constraints, such as the scaling of wiring complexity, can inform us as to how and why the brain chooses certain designs over others. I believe that this process of implementing and overcoming the physical constraints of the brain in hardware will allow us to establish a common language between artificial intelligence and neuroscience, fields that are largely disjoint today. This common language would allow a huge amount of information to flow between AI and neuroscience and help us come to a better understanding of the brain. Obviously, understanding the brain is a huge challenge. 
People have been trying to understand the brain ever since we realized that the brain is the seat of consciousness. But along the way, we have accumulated a huge amount of knowledge, and we're now approaching a fundamental understanding of how neural networks function, as evidenced by the incredible things that we can do with them. When I first started my research, the brain seemed like a total mystery. It seemed completely incomprehensible. But the more I study it, the more I'm convinced that it can be understood. The pace of progress in neural networks right now is breathtaking. I really encourage anyone who's interested in AI or neuroscience to just jump right in. There has never been a better time to make an impact. Thank you.